Okay, so this week we're talking about light. Now, light is a super important concept for astronomy because basically that's how we understand everything about the universe. Uh, we look out and we see stuff and we measure what's out there by looking at the light that they give off. Um, so, uh, the, the, in particular, I want to post a video here about what we call thermal radiation, which is a specific type of light that's given off by generally just hot stuff. Um, and so um, I want to give some examples now, just as kind of a, I don't know if it's a warning or what, but uh, we will be doing some math this week. It's not going to be difficult, but I will expect you to understand this to go through and do some examples. And so I want to present a couple of examples here just to show you how it works. So let's start off here. Um, just a background about what is light. Um, now I, I could give the, the technical definition. It's a disturbance of the electric and magnetic field, blah, blah, blah. But basically light is just a, a, a little particle of energy that travels through the universe. And our eyes happen to be able to detect this, but we can also use um, more advanced cameras and detectors to also detect this, this energy traveling through the universe. Um, yeah, if you go through and take a Physics 1 and Physics 2 class, we'll get into exactly what is light. And it does have to do um, directly with electric magnetic fields, but you don't have to understand the exact details of that to understand the, the basic principles of light. Uh, the second thing that's important is that light travels as a wave. It has a, a wavelength. We can measure that exact wavelength, how far from peak to peak to peak of a, of a light wave, uh, in just the same way that a, a splash of water makes a, a, a wave, a ripple pattern through the water. And um, we measure, in order to determine what type of light we're looking at, we have to know the wavelength of it. And so that's how we d determine the different types of light that, there, that are out there. Uh, now, the wavelengths that we're talking about as far as light are very, very, very tiny in the scale of billions of meters. There's no way we could d ever directly measure these, these wavelengths. Uh, but fortunately, our eyes actually have a really nice way of measuring it, which, which is by color. So uh, the types of light that, first of all, we can see a very small portion of the entire spectrum of light. Um, now, if we, go, if we look at the wavelengths of light, and if we divide light up into different wavelengths, the very, very, very shortest wavelength of light um, light that has a very, very short wavelength is what we call gamma rays. Now, gamma rays, it's a type of light. Again, everything that we're going to be talking about here is a type of light. Our eyes can't see gamma rays, but it's still light. Uh, the reason we can't see gamma rays is that the wavelengths are so short, our eyes aren't tuned to be able to see that. Uh, now, it's also a property as we go from the longest wavelength, I'm sorry, as we go from the, the shortest wavelengths here, gamma rays, to the very longest wavelengths, radio waves, uh, as the wavelength gets longer, the energy gets lower, or vice versa. As the wavelength gets shorter, when we go closer and closer to gamma rays, we get more and more energetic light. So gamma rays are the very highest energetic light out there. And um, fortunately, our sun is not currently giving off gamma rays. That would be a bad thing. Uh, now, if we, if we go into a little bit longer wavelengths, going from gamma rays, if we stretch out the wavelength a little more, we start talking about what's called x-rays. Now, again, x-rays are just a type of light. It's a type of electromagnetic uh, disturbance, but it, again, it's the exact same thing. It's just the wavelength is still too small for our eyes to, to see, but it's still a type of light. Um, now, um, X-rays have a little bit longer wavelength than gamma rays, and so that means they have a little bit less energy as well. And again, the longer the wavelength, the less energy the light has. Now, if we stretch out even a little bit more, we get to a type of light that we're a little bit more familiar with. Our eyes still can't quite see this, but um, the sun is giving off a, quite a bit of uh, ultraviolet light. And as we know, if you stay out in the sun too long, you're going to get burnt because it's the ultraviolet light that the sun's giving off that, um, that has this bad effect on us. Um, but again, and the reason that ultraviolet light is worse for us is that it still has a little bit more energy than the type of light that we're used to, which is what we call visible light. Now, this visible light, the visible light that our eyes can see, is a very tiny part of the entire spectrum. But um, fortunately, it also happens to be the type of light that the sun gives off the most of. And we'll see why that is here. But um, what, what our eyes can see and what we typically refer to as light in everyday language, again, is just a very small part of all the different types of light that are out there. And again, it's all the exact same thing, except we just our eyes are only fine-tuned to see only a very small part of this stuff. So if we stretch out visible light to even longer wavelengths, then we start talking about what's called infrared light. Now, infrared light has just a slightly longer wavelength than what our eyes are able to see, and therefore it also has a little bit less energy. And now, infrared light, we've gotten into this a little bit, but this is the exact type of light that is dealt with in the, in the greenhouse effect. When you get kind of somewhat warm objects, they tend to give off mostly infrared light. And so this is why, when we're talking about the greenhouse effect, when the Earth warms up, it gets warm enough to start giving off infrared light. 
but it's not quite hot enough to be able to give off visible light. And we'll, we'll talk about exactly what that means here. Now, finally, the very longest wavelengths of light that we deal with are what we call radio waves. Now, um, common misconception, radio waves are not a type of sound wave. The, the sound waves when you go in your car and you, um, you turn on the radio, what's happening is that these, um, the radio antennas, the, the big tall things that you see in the, in the cow fields, are, um, uh, they're giving off a type of light. We can't see that light again because it, the wavelength is so long, our eyes aren't able to see it. But it is indeed a type of light. And that light, in particular radio light, travels from the antennas to our cars, and our cars are able to transform that light, the, the, the signals that they're getting from the, from the light rays, the radio waves, into sound waves in the speakers. But radio waves, again, it's important. Radio waves are actually a type of light wave. And it just so happens that our car is able to see that type of light and transform that type of light into sound that we hear. So uh, let's look at the visible spectrum itself, the, the visible part of this entire, what we call the electromagnetic spectrum. Now, it, it's, again, we're only seeing a very small part of the spectrum, and um, the smallest, the, the shortest wavelengths of light that our eyes are able to see are about 400 billionths of a meter, or what we call 400 nanometers, nm. There we go. Um, and then the, the longest light waves that we can see are 700 billionths of a meter, or 700 nanometers. So there, there's a range going from 400 nanometers, which our eyes detect as uh, deep violet or blue light. And then as we get to slightly, slightly longer and longer wavelengths, we start seeing our eyes detect the, the longer wavelengths as then uh, lighter blue, green, yellow, and the very longest wavelengths that our eyes can see are a deep red at about 700, just slightly more than 700 nanometers. And so this forms what's called the visible spectrum of light. And going from the, the longest wavelengths to shortest, the, the typical mnemonic is the Roy G. Biv spectrum, or red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. You've probably heard this at some point in high school, but that's really important to understand. Uh, so memorize this, write this out, come up with some better mnemonic, if you will. But um, it's important to understand it, uh, that it goes in that order, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, or generally from red at the very longest wavelengths to blue at the very shortest. And that's really important to know. Blue is the shortest wavelength and red is the longest. Um, when we start talking about the universe and start talking about galaxies moving away from us, you have to understand that red light has longer wavelengths uh, because we start talking about something called redshift. Uh, but I'll postpone that to later in the semester. But again, just make sure you understand that red light has the longest wavelengths and blue has the shortest that our eyes can see. Um, and again, just going off from that a little bit, if we stretch out the wavelengths a little bit more, we go from red at about 700 nanometers to infrared, even longer than that, at 800, 900, 1,000 nanometers and, and more. And then with blue, if we go to even shorter wavelengths than, than the visible light, we go into you know, 350, 300, 250 nanometers. We go from violet light to ultraviolet light, or even more, even shorter than violet light. So that's where the names infrared, or longer than red, and ultraviolet, or higher than violet, come from. So, okay, so what is thermal radiation? This is, this is a, a really important subject here, and it's a focus of a lot of the chapter. So, infrared radiation is the type of light that any warm object emits. And um, it, it has a couple key properties. So, again, we talked a little bit about in the greenhouse effect that when the Earth warms up, it starts giving off infrared light. And it's giving off that infrared light because it has thermal properties, because it's warm. But the nice thing is, no matter what something's temperature is, it's still giving off infrared. I mean, sorry, it's still giving off thermal radiation. And it turns out that uh, the the type of light, whether it's infrared or visible or ultraviolet, or even in the gamma rays, um, the only thing that determines what type of light that warm object is giving off is its temperature. If it's very cold temperature, it gives off very low energy light. And remember, the lowest energy light, the longest wavelength, are radio waves. So in the universe, very cold gases, they're still giving off this thermal radiation, but it has really low energy. And so very cold things give off radio waves. So the cool thing is, if you, if you ever meet a, a radio astronomer, you can know it's a pretty good bet that they're looking at really cold blobs of gas in the universe. Uh, now, as, as this very cold blob of gas heats up and it starts getting to warmer and warmer temperatures, now the light that's giving off has a little bit more energy. And so the wavelength of the light that it's giving off shortens and it becomes it starts giving off infrared light the warmer it gets 
So if you meet an infrared astronomer, which I've done a fair amount of this in my in my research, um, you you start talking about warm patches of the universe where maybe a star is just forming, or maybe a star has died and it's just cooling off. So infrared light is given off by warm objects, but again, it's still a type of radiation and it's still uh, what we call thermal radiation. Now, when you when you get into hot enough temperatures in the thousands of degrees, which is uh, the temperature of stars, stars are hot enough that they're giving off high enough energy light that we can actually see it. And the reason we can see stars is that they are giving off thermal radiation with enough energy that our eyes can see it in the, in the visible part of the spectrum. So hot objects or stars give off visible light, which is neat because we can see them. Um, but now let's, let's say we get an ultra hot star, something that's 30,000 degrees Kelvin or, or more, 60,000 Fahrenheit. Uh, it's so hot, the light it gives off has so much energy, it actually falls in the ultraviolet part of the spectrum. So even shorter wavelengths or even higher energy than visible light. And when, once we start talking about the very hottest things in the universe, uh, stars exploding, uh, mergers between black holes, which actually do happen, uh, when we start talking about the very hottest, most energetic events in the universe, the, the light that these events or objects give off is so high energy that it, it's actually in the, in the X-ray or the gamma ray part of the spectrum. But again, the whole idea here is that when we talk about thermal radiation, it's light being given off by an object at a certain temperature. And if we can measure the wavelength of that light, we can determine exactly what temperature the object is, which is awesome. So there's a couple, um, yeah, so, so again, just to, to you know, coin a term, it's the universal thermometer. Uh, if we know the wavelength of the light given off and we can directly measure that, then we automatically know the object's temperature. And the, so when we talk about light, what we do is we make, we, we plot up, we make a graph of how much light that object is giving off in all the parts of the spectrum from radio to gamma rays, or, or we can narrow it down to just the visible part of the spectrum. How much green light is star giving off versus how much red light versus how much violet light. And that pattern that we see turns out it's the same for every object, except that it's moved over longer and shorter wavelength, and it might be more and less light. So I'll describe exactly what I mean in a second here. But um, there's a very important part of the spectrum, and I'll show it here in a second. But where that spectrum peaks, the very top of that spectrum, or the wavelength of light that object is giving off the most of, is what we call the peak wavelength. And we write that as lambda, this Greek kind of weird symbol there, lambda max. By the way, lambda is used for, for the length of light, lambda L, wavelength L. Um, but so lambda sub max or lambda max is what we always call the peak wavelength of light. So here's an example of the sun spectra, the sun spectrum. So we're, what we're doing here on this axis, axis, we're graphing the wavelength of light going and, and we're concentrating mainly on the visible part of the spectrum from 400 to 700 nanometers. But we're showing how much, we're showing the wavelength of light and on this axis, we're graphing up how much light the sun is giving off at every wavelength. So over here in the ultraviolet part of the spectrum, even shorter wavelength than violet, the sun's not giving off that much UV light. It's giving off enough to give us, it's giving off enough to give us a sunburn, but it's not giving off all that much light here in the ultraviolet part. Now, as we start getting into the violet part and the blue part of the spectrum, now we're seeing that the sun's giving off a little bit more light in this in this in the short wavelength but visible part of the spectrum but once we get into about the green and almost the yellow part of the spectrum here this is where the sun is giving off the most of its light um, and so our sun looks yellow to us turns out that if we if we get in outer space outside of our atmosphere the sun actually looks a little more green uh, and that's because the majority of the sun's light or the peak of its spectrum occurs right around in the green part of of the visible spectrum so this is the sun's peak wavelength here. And we're actually gonna calculate exactly what that peak wavelength is, which is kind of an awesome example. But now when we start talking about longer, where is my cursor? Uh, when we start talking about longer and longer wavelengths, getting the orange and the red part, we see that now that the sun's giving off a little bit less red light than it is yellow. And even longer, the infrared part, the, the longer wavelengths, the sun is giving off even less infrared than it is red. But again, the important thing is that it's this kind of nice round, peaking curve, and the very maximum of it is the lambda max, which we call the peak wavelength. And the cool thing is, 
every object that's emitting thermal radiation or any warm object emits a curve of exactly this shape. It's just that it peaks maybe further to the left or further to the right in the ultraviolet part or in the infrared part. So um, there are a couple laws that describe exactly the type of light or the peak wavelength of light that objects are giving off. Now the first is called Wien's Law. And um, what it says in, in short is that the hotter something is, the shorter its peak wavelength. Or the way to think about that is when something gets hotter, its temperature goes up, the energy of light that it gives off is also higher. So the hotter something is, the higher energy light. And we know that higher energy light has a shorter wavelength. So it's kind of a A leads to B leads to C type of reasoning, but the hotter something is, the shorter the wavelength it gives off. So what that means is that a very hot object has a very short wavelength. The light it's giving off is, is very high, uh, high in energy. So a hot object has a shorter wavelength, which looks bluer. Remember, blue light has a very short wavelength. And then a cooler object, when it cools off, the wavelength gets longer, and so it looks redder to us. So cool objects look red, hot objects look blue. And we can actually see this when we look at the stars in the sky. If you see a, a reddish looking star, that's not Mars, by the way, Mars also does look red uh, for a different reason. But when we see a, a, a star that looks a little bit redder than normal, um, it's probably a star that's a little bit cooler than our sun. And then if we see a star that looks a little bit bluer, it's probably a star that's very hot. And when we start talking about the types of stars, you'll, you'll learn exactly what that means and what types of star those are. Now, there's a, a cool simulator that is actually going to be in your lab this week or next. I'm not quite sure which. Um, but so we can actually simulate exactly the, um, what the spectrum of light given off by objects at different temperatures is. So right now, I'm graphing up the spectrum of light given off by a star that's about 5,800 Kelvin. Now, Kelvin is a, the scale that we use to, to measure temperatures. Roughly, if you double it, that's about the degrees Fahrenheit. So 5,800 Kelvin is roughly about 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. And by the way, that's the temperature of our sun. We'll tell exactly how we know that later. But so let's say that we want to make the temperature higher. If we want to increase the temperature of that star, what direction is this graph going to move? So we have this graph right now is peaked around 500 or so nanometers. Now, if we make this hotter, hotter stars give off higher energy light, which has a shorter wavelength. Remember, shorter wavelength is higher energy. So if, if I increase the slider here and I make a hotter star, this whole curve is going to shift to the left. So the peak is going to move to the left. And now watch, watch this actually happen. So 5800 Kelvin, now we start moving it to uh, higher temperatures, and the peak has moved from there further to the left. So hotter objects are giving off their light in the, now it's actually the ultraviolet part of the spectrum here, shorter than violet light. And let's take that back down to 5800. Again, the temperature of our sun. There we go, close enough. Now the peak here for our sun is again in kind of the greenish, almost the yellowish part of the spectrum. But let's make that even cooler. Now, the, the cooler the star gets, the longer the light it's giving off because it's lower in energy. So cooler and the whole thing is moving to the right because it's cooler and it's giving off lower and lower energy light or longer and longer wavelengths. So you'll, you'll be able to explore this a lot more in the lab. But um, yeah, it, it's kind of neat to see you increase temperature, the whole spectrum shifts to the left because it's um, shorter and shorter wavelengths or higher and higher energy light. Okay, so the second law that deals with the type of light that warm objects are giving off is called Stefan's Law, or it's the Stefan-Boltzmann Law. You'll see sometimes I think that's what the book says. So what this says is not only is the energy of the light getting higher when an object gets hotter, so not only is the, is, is the light getting shorter, but it also gives off more and more of it. Now, um, this is actually kind of familiar to us. If you have a really, a, a very cool fire, um, it's not giving off much light, but the hotter that fire gets, the more and more light it's giving off as well. Uh, and there, there are other, I guess, somewhat obvious examples, but the hotter something gets, the more of this light it gives off. So a hotter star is not only going to give off, is not only going to give off bluer light, but it's also going to give off a whole lot more light. And a really dim star is going to give off only a little bit of light. Now, this is, by the way, this is how your, um, if you have a, a light bulb in your house that has a slider, you can turn the brightness up and down continuously. That's exactly how this works. 
the filament in the light bulb is getting hotter, and so it's giving off more light. And then when you pull it down, it's making that filament cooler, and it's giving off less total light. And specifically, the way this works is that um, your book talks a little more about this, but the, the intensity of the light, or how much light it's giving off, is proportional to the temperature to the fourth power. So if you double the temperature, the intensity of the light actually increases by a factor of 16. 2 times 2 times 2 times 2, or 2 to the fourth power, 2, 4, 8, 16. And furthermore, in Stefan's Law, not only does objects start giving off more and more light, but it actually gives off more light at every single wavelength. So let's look back at, um, actually, no, I think this describes it better. OK, so putting this together here. A, hotter objects give off shorter wavelengths, or their peak wavelength is shorter. So the whole graph shifts to the left. And B, hotter objects give off more light overall. The whole graph shifts upwards. So let's do an example here. Here is the spectrum roughly of our sun, which is pretty close to uh, 6,000 Kelvin. Now we see that it peaks somewhere in the middle of the visible part of the spectrum, somewhere between blue and red light. So our sun's peak wavelength is right about there, and it's, it's medium high in this graph. But now let's talk about a hotter star, something about three times as hot, a blue star. So the reason it looks bluer is that, first of all, the peak wavelength has shifted to the left. It's gone from being right about here to right about there. So the whole spectrum shifts to the left. But also because it's hotter, it's also moved upwards. And there's no point along this curve, along the blue curve here, that's lower than this yellow curve. Or no matter what wavelength you look at, a blue star is giving off more light than a yellow star, than our sun. So we see that it's the peak wavelength is higher, but let's look at th this blue star is even giving off more yellowish light than this yellow star. But the reason it looks blue is that the most light it's giving off is in the blue part of the spectrum. I, I hope that makes sense. But the whole graph has moved upwards, and it's also shifted to the left. But now let's look at a dim star, um, or not a dim star, but a cool star, about 4,000 Kelvin. We see that as it cools off, the peak moves to the right, and the whole spectrum moves down, too. So the hotter it gets, the hotter it gets, the further to the left, or the shorter the wavelength, and the more overall energy it's giving off, the more overall light, so it shifts upwards. So um, again, this is really important. These two laws, Wien's law, the, the hotter, the shorter the wavelength, and Stefan's law, the hotter, the more light. So um, there, we actually, like I said, we're going to be doing some math. It's simple, and I'll show some examples. But this is, these are how the equations look here. Wien's law, to find this peak temperature, I'm sorry, the, the peak wavelength, what you do is you take this constant. It's, it's just a constant. 2,900,000, and you divide it by the temperature of that star, but you need to, or the temperature of any object, but you need to make sure that you're expressing the temperature in Kelvin. It doesn't work when you do it in Fahrenheit or even in Celsius. So again, to find the peak wavelength, you just take 2,900,000 and divide it by however hot that thing is in Kelvin. And again, just to make it clear, this, this 2,900,000 figure this is just, it's simply constant the same way that um, if you have a linear equation, y is equal to mx plus b, that m is just, it, it's a constant. It doesn't really have much importance other than you need it there, um, you know, making it as simple as that. Um, so, Wien's Law. Now, Stefan's Law, it has this weird kind of a Greek symbol in here. It's called a sigma. But what this says is that the intensity of light, or the energy of the light the star is giving off, is equal to this constant, and we don't need to worry about the number, it's just simply a constant, times the temperature of that thing to the fourth power. And that, that, that to the fourth power is a huge thing, because like I said, if you double the temperature, the intensity of the star actually increases by a factor of 16, 2 to the fourth power, or 16. Now, by the way, this constant, I, I kind of like this, because the, in, if you plug in numbers for this, it's actually 5.67 times 10 to the minus 8 or just five, six, seven, eight, um, pretty easy to remember. But yeah, so again, the, the thing here is all you need to know is the temperature to find the intensity, and all you need to know in Wien's Law is the temperature to find the peak wavelength. 
So the only variable in this at all is the temperature. You don't need to know anything else about it. Not how big it is, not how cool it looks, and well, cool in the sense of how neat it looks. Um, the only thing that matters is the temperature of that thing. So let's do some examples here. Let's look at a brown, a brown dwarf star. And we'll talk a little bit more about what a brown dwarf is later in the semester. But the thing that you need to know about brown dwarfs is that they're cooler stars. They never quite got hot enough to become real stars. And so we, we happen to know, and, and we, I will explain how we know this, but we happen to know that, that um, uh, brown dwarfs have a temperature of about 3,000 Kelvin. That's a little bit less than uh, 5,500 Fahrenheit or so. So let's figure out the exact peak wavelength that a brown dwarf would emit. Now, we have a clue here. It's called a brown dwarf. So hopefully our answer will fall somewhere in maybe the, the reddish or deep reddish part of the spectrum. But we'll find out here. So first of all, we're going to plug it into this equation. We're going to take the 3,000 Kelvin, again, the temperature expressed in Kelvin, and we're just going to put on the bottom of this fraction, 2,900,000 divide by 300,000. Now this is ultra simple, just plug it, into, plug it into a calculator. The answer you get is 967. I keep losing my mouse. Uh, 2,900,000 divided by 3,000 is just 967. And by the way, the answer always comes out when you do it like this. The answer is always nanometers. I've plugged it in directly into the equation here. But so a brown dwarf's peak temperature is 960s, I'm sorry, its peak wavelength is 967 nanometers. So what part of the spectrum does this fall in? So remember, the, the visible part of the spectrum goes from about 400 nanometers for blue violet light to about 700 nanometers red light. Now, clearly 960 sum is, is a lot more than 700 nanometers. So infrared light. Infrared light, even longer wavelength than red light. So we take 700 nanometers. Obviously, 967 is, is even longer. So a brown dwarf actually gives off most of its energy. It has the peak of its curve occurs in the infrared part of the spectrum. So that's why I say when you meet an, when you meet an infrared astronomer, they're probably looking at cooler stars or, or cool patches of gas. And in fact, uh, brown dwarfs is actually kind of a neat study in infrared astronomy because we're seeing stars that are, that are too cool that our eyes can really detect. But the only way we can see them is looking at infrared light because the stars are, are, are cool enough that their light doesn't quite have enough energy for our eyes to see. So that's one example, and it's, you know, really, it's pretty straightforward. Now let's do another one here. Let's figure out exactly what the peak wavelength of our sun is. So, I'm uh, sorry, let's go back. No, we know what the peak wavelength of our sun is. And we, we can take our sun's spectrum, we can look at that curve, and we, we can figure out exactly what wavelength the sun is giving off most of its light. And we happen to know that peak wavelength is exactly 501.9 nanometers. And we can measure this very accurately. So the cool thing is, this is exactly how we know how hot the sun is. So what we do, we take that peak wavelength, we know the left-hand side of the equation, but we don't directly know the sun's temperature. We've never been able to get a, a thermometer and just stick it into the sun. Obviously, it doesn't work. Uh, so, But we do know the temperature because we've been able to do some math. Not meth, math, math. Um, and we, we know the peak wavelength of the sun, and we just invert the equation to find the temperature. And here's how that works. What you do is you can do, you can cross multiply, blah, blah, blah. But the answer that comes out is the temperature, what was on the bottom of this fraction, is now equal to 2,900,000 divided by the peak wavelength expressed in nanometers. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this equation now and use this to find the sun's temperature directly. So, and there's a square around it, I guess, because it's important. <laughs> but um, so again, let, let's go through this and let's actually do this. So we're going we're gonna to use the inverted version of the equation here. T is equal to 2,900,000 divided by the peak wavelength, lambda max. So we're just going to plug that number in to the bottom, of the, the bottom of the fraction and plug it into a calculator. And you get up 5,778 degrees Kelvin. And we know this precisely. It, it's actually pretty awesome how accurately we know the sun's temperature without ever getting very close to it. So that's, in fact, how we know the temperature of the sun. And that's actually, by the way, how we know the temperature of almost every star that's out there. Because we can look at the spectrum of light from that star and figure out exactly where it peaks. And when you know where it peaks, you can just do very basic math and find out directly what the temperature of the star is. So it's extremely useful to astronomers, uh, astronomers uh, because this is how we know the temperature of stuff in the universe. 
uh, obviously, if you, if you go through this and if you look at the spectrum and it turns out it peaks at really short wavelengths, you can just use this same exact equation here and find that, oh, hey, this thing is a million degrees. Or if it peaks at very long wavelengths, you know, let, let's say if, if, if the wavelength that's going off is half of a meter, which is a pretty long wavelength, what we find is that the temperature now is very cold, meaning that it's probably a cold patch of gas that's giving off radio waves. And we can directly measure how hot or how cold whatever that object is by using this, this version of the equation right there. So just to wrap it up here, again, when we're talking about gamma rays, x-rays, UV visible infrared radio waves, all those types of waves are just the same thing as visible light that we can see, except the wavelength is a little bit longer or a little bit too short for our eyes to, to see. But everything is light in this thing. It's just that our eyes can only see a little tiny bit of all the possible light that's out there. And looking at the visible part of the spectrum, again, you should memorize red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. And just as importantly, you need to know that the blue light has much shorter wavelengths and red light has much longer wavelengths. And by the way, once you know that, then you can, you, you can know for sure. If you know that red has longer wavelengths, you know that infrared has even longer wavelengths than that. And if you know that violet or blue light has the shortest, then you know that ultraviolet has even shorter wavelengths. So that's kind of how I remember it. And then you should be familiar with and you should know how to work basic problems involving Wien's law and Stefan's law. Uh, you know, obviously there's some examples here. There's also some examples in the uh, mathematical insights in your textbook. Uh, and then your homework will have a couple of examples too. But the most important thing here is that Wien's law says that the hotter something gets, the shorter the wavelength. Or we can think of it the more energy the light is given, giving off. And also Stefan's law says that the hotter it gets, the more light overall, the t more total light it's giving off. So the brighter it is. So um, again, do some practice with this stuff. Um, go through some you know practice problems in the book or in the homework, and um, make sure you know this because it's ultra important. And we, when we start talking about the different types of stars, you absolutely need to be familiar with how this stuff works. So um, it's not that tough, and it's actually really cool that we can figure this stuff out too. All right, good luck.